Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Hello, everybody. Today, I have here with me Anna Dearman Cornick. <laughs> Did I say that correctly, Anna? I meant to That's ask it. You, you nailed it. That's me. Woohoo! Um, she has a, a name that's spelled like it sounds. It's a miracle. <laughs> Anna is a time management coach, a wife, and a mom who helps busy professionals and business owners master time management. Who do I need to know about this? <laughs> so, so they can stop feeling overwhelmed and start spending time on what matters most. As the host of It's About Time, a podcast about work, life and balance, Anna shares time management tips, productivity strategies, and real life advice to help her listeners make the most of their time. In addition to teaching actionable takeaways, which I love actionable takeaways, yes. <laughs> Anna interviews other go-getters to find out how they navigate family, friends, fulfilling careers, and full schedules. Welcome, Anna. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. I am so excited to spend time with you and to, to talk with your audience and to talk about time management, everybody's favorite topic, right? <laughs> Well, you know, it's not a favorite topic, and I think you said that a little facetiously, but it is something that we are, that we all struggle with. I literally don't know anybody except maybe now that I know you that struggles with us. So Anna, tell us how you got into specializing in this. Sure. So it's an interesting journey. One of my first jobs out of college was actually um, scheduler to a member of Congress on Capitol Hill. I spent... 12 hour days, basically st staring at an outlook calendar, managing, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of meeting invitations. So not only was I uh, working as a scheduler, which I'm sure you can tell it's all about managing their schedule um, for a new congressman, but he was the first Vietnamese congressman in the history of the United States. So he was incredibly in high demand with both, you know, local constituents, statewide organizations, national and international organizations. And so I really went from a, you know, a public relations study in college to jumping into this world of politics and managing crazy schedules. And so that was really my first step up into time management because as you can imagine there are a lot of moving pieces and parts when it comes to the day-to-day -day life of a member of congress and so after spending some time on the hill i moved back to louisiana where i you know dove headfirst into a number of crisis communication and public affairs roles for government agencies I went on to specialize in crisis communication at a boutique PR firm in New Orleans. Uh, you name it, oil spills, droughts, um, universities on the brink of financial collapse, nonprofit embezzlement schemes, you know, plant explosion. Wow. Like you name it, I have, probably, I have probably escorted someone down a hidden freight elevator and into a back alley in order to avoid TV cameras. True story. That was my life for about a decade. And as you can imagine, the 24-7 always on call lifestyle of crisis communications it's not exactly calm, carefree, you know, footloose and fancy free. Uh, it led to, it led to burnout pretty quickly. And, you know, after one too many days of crying in the staircase on my way up to my windowless cubicle, I knew that <laughs> enough. I know that enough. feeling. Yes. Right. I mean, I feel like we've all had that crying in the staircase moment at some point, whether it was in the parking lot or on our kitchen floor, um, 
I knew that something had to give. I knew something had to change, that there was a better way. And I didn't know what that way was at the time, but I was determined to figure it out and to somehow use these gifts that I had been given for communication and, you know, basically creating order out of chaos to help other women either dig themselves out of the dark hole that I had found myself in or to avoid it altogether. And so after some more trial and error, I found, I found coaching and I made the decision that I would focus on time management because after hearing so many friends, coworkers, just people say that, you know, I struggle with time management, you know, time is our most precious non-renewable resource and we don't learn how to manage time well in school. Nobody taught us this stuff. You know, that's why we all struggle with it. And, you know, there's, there's gotta be a way and I, this is now what I dedicate my time, my life and my career to, but there's got to be a way to really drill down into what truly matters most and to design a life that fits what matters most. And so that's, that's what I do now as a time management coach and speaker. I work with other professionals and business owners one-on-one. -on -one. I have a group coaching program that I launch each summer, and um, it's really all about, you know, getting to the heart of, of what matters most and how you spend your time. Wow. Well, what you do is so greatly needed, and I love um, the focus that you have on women also, because, you know, even though we're in a more enlightened era where women have really amazing careers, they still are the ones that most of the childcare and the housework and all of those other domestic duties still fall to. Absolutely. So we do have a lot more to juggle typically mm -hmm. uh, still than our husbands, spouses, whatever. Do you yeah. see that also in the women that you work with? Absolutely. You know, as women, we shoulder so much of what's called emotional labor that, you know, yes. you think about the, the around the holidays, you know, who of a couple is more likely to, you know, put together the gift list or wrap the gifts or coordinate the presents right. and it, to coordinate the menus and what is the travel and all of those it, it, family admin, family administrative tasks so often end up falling on the woman or the wife in That's so right. many cases. And it's often, you know, unseen, many times unacknowledged, sometimes unappreciated because it's oh, looked yeah. at as just the default assignment. And it, and it does. I mean, even in, I, you know, I have friends now who, you know, strive to keep equal responsibilities in their homes. And I'll say my husband does a great job. My husband does a great job at, you know, having us help each other, but really there's still that just so much that falls on women that we have to shoulder that we, that we do in addition to our jobs, in addition yeah. to managing our careers, right. and our health right. and our well being, and all of the things. Right. Yeah. My best friend um, is a perfect example. She uh, is a director of nursing mm -hmm. and her husband is a musician who plays in a band maybe once a month. Mm -hmm. um, and yet she has to do all the shopping and the cooking mm -hmm. and the cleaning. Yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> because even when she tries to get him to go do it, then like he's at the grocery store taking pictures of stuff and sending them to her or texting her wow. and asking so many questions that she's like, forget it. It's faster if I just do it yeah. myself. Yeah. And that's, that's, <laughs> that is, that is tough. It's the setting them up for the success. You know, it's almost like hiring an employee in a lot of ways or yes. <laughs> on an assistant in order, yeah. like all of the work that goes into empowering that individual to make decisions, yes. it's it's almost mm -hmm. like treating your family like a business and thinking, okay, how can I best equip my husband or my partner to make this decision 
without me? Or how can I not lower my standards, but how can I be okay with good enough rather than perfect? I mean, maybe he didn't get the exact right pasta, but we've got pasta. That's right. Yeah. And she definitely has a challenge with that. She, she is like a perfectionist. Yeah. Um, so I love that you said that. So it's so interesting because my husband and I, mm, I guess it was about a month ago now, we kind of got into it a little bit because, um, and I find this is an ongoing thing. I've had a business since 2001. Mm-hmm. He's been retired since then. Mm-hmm. Um, he had agreed to do all the domestic work while I made the money. Awesome. And yet I'm sure you know what really happened there. um and and so he like in this area that you can see where I'm working we have a tiny house Mm -hmm. and behind this curtain is his desk that he never uses okay Okay. he never uses it but it's taking up the majority of the room and so I had to talk with him about getting rid of it he's like I can't go that's my desk you know that's an important thing it's you know it's like part of him right And um, he said, you know, I feel like you're trying to manage me. And so I thought about that a little bit. And I said, I'll tell you what, you get to manage all the house except the office. And the office I manage. Would that work? I won't manage you having to do with anything else having to do with the house. And you won't try to manage the office. And he goes, well, I think that could work. And once I said it like that, he got rid of the desk. It's still here because we haven't actually had it moved out yet, but he's, you know, giving it away to somebody. He's clearing it out. And by the end of January, I'll have this whole area as my office instead of literally, I I mean, I cannot move now. I'm so cramped in here because of this huge desk he never uses. But that's so interesting that, that you said you need to do it like a business. If he hadn't said you're trying to manage me, I wouldn't have thought of it. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you said that because that's a great tip to mm-hmm. think about managing it like you manage your business. Right. I mean, it, you know, romance, yes, love, romance, marriage, all of those things. But, you know, it's also, a, it's a partnership. It's a partnership. And yes. you, you're both on the same team and, you know, you've got mm-hmm. to figure out ways to work together. And sometimes that takes being very clever. <laughs> <laughs> like, like giving him the opportunity to be the master of the rest of the domain and That's you are right. the master exactly. of the office. I love it. That's great. That's That's right. That's That's right. Clever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, we've been married 26 years, so I've kind of figured a few things out. The other thing that I do is um, if I want something that's really expensive, um, and, you know, I want him to be in agreement with what I'm doing, I put together a sales presentation. I think through how I'm going to present it to him. (laughs) That is fantastic. Ooh, do you see now? I feel like we're starting to get into things like personality types or love languages and communication styles. So in addition to being a time management coach, I'm actually a certified Myers-Briggs practitioner. So I can Mm. give the MBTI and knowing my husband, Scott's Myers-Briggs type has been very, very helpful in knowing how to approach him. And of course, it's not just him, but anytime I work with a new client, I almost always have them take the Myers-Briggs and we do a full debrief just so that I am clued into those personality preferences because it's like a shortcut to which strategies are going to work well. We all have these innate preferences. We have ways that we prefer to take in information and be communicated with and when you know that about whether it's a spouse or a boss or an assistant or a coworker, you're able to speak their language in a way, you know, for some people putting together a sales presentation would be the last thing that they want to see. But the fact that you know that about your husband and that it works well, I mean, that's dynamite. Mm-hmm. He needs the facts and figures and the benefits to him and what it's really going to cost, not only the initial, but the long term and what we're going to get out of it. And if I can share all of that with him succinctly, because he don't want a lot of jabber jabber. Yep. um, (laughs) It's to the point. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Then, then it doesn't take him any time to go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. Let's do that. 
that's and great. then I've got him. So yeah, that's a really good idea. I hadn't actually thought about having him take one of those tests. I've, I have people on my team take tests. I Before I hire people, I have them take tests, but I never thought about having my husband do that. Oh yeah. And I'll do that sometimes for my clients. Um, you know, of course they will, my client will take the Myers-Briggs for our work together. But a lot of times during the debrief, they, it arouses so much curiosity about their significant other that they're like, oh, can I, can I have my husband take this? Can we do a debrief together? And I'll say, you know, disclaimer, I am not a marriage counselor, but I would be, <laughs> I would be happy to coordinate for him to take it. And then for the two of you to have a joint session to talk about it. But again, not a marriage counselor. <laughs> Yeah, really good idea. So everybody, including me, that everyone I know, including me, struggles with time management. Mm -hmm. So what tips, Anna, and I love that you can give actionable tips. What tips can you give in the short time we have together here today to help anybody like me begin to get that under control? Yeah, absolutely. This is the stuff that I love. Um, so I'll, I always start out by being very clear that time management does not begin on the pages of your calendar. It does not begin with the appointments on your Google calendar, or your Outlook calendar. Um, I believe that time management begins with heart management because you have to first get crystal clear on what truly means the most to you before you can begin to effectively manage your time. And the thing is, is that in the hustle and bustle of life, when we're running from one thing to the next obligations that we wish we had not said yes to, it's really hard to find that time to pause and reflect and get clear on what matters most. And so I always say, you know, first take time to really articulate what your personal goals are, what your personal core values are, like what are those things that mean the most to you and really understand what that is first. Because like I said, you can have a full calendar with tons of meetings and yet none of it will reflect what actually means the most. And that's why we feel frazzled. That's why we feel overwhelmed. And that's why we feel pushed to the brink because our time is being filled with things that aren't meaningful for us. So that's the first thing we've got to, we've got to tackle. We've got to get that out of the way is knowing what matters most. And then, you know, once you're clear on that, could I pause you just a sec? Absolutely. So any tip, any tip on how to figure out what matters the most? Here we go. It's called a list of 100 dreams because for some of us, it's been so long since we have paused to actually think about, you know, what, well, what do I want to do? What matters to me? Sit down with a blank sheet of paper and challenge yourself to write 100 dreams that you want to have, do, see, experience, travel in your lifetime. These could be places you want to go. They could be books you want to read, skills you want to learn, books you want to write. They could be friendships you want to cultivate or additions you want to make on your house or, you know, properties you want to buy in Costa Rica. I don't know. The sky's the limit. Or babies you want to have. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> babies you want to have as I am currently 30 weeks pregnant as we are recording this interview. Um, so that one's, that one's definitely a big one on the list. But the, the cool thing is, is that when you push yourself to come up with a hundred things, you have to be specific. You can't say travel more. You have to think, okay, where do I want to go? I want to see the Eiffel Tower in real life. I want to do that thing where I hold my hand up in a picture of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I want to go, <laughs> you know, you have to, it, it forces you to be specific. And then what happens is as you're looking at this list of a hundred dreams, you start to notice patterns. You start to notice themes, dream themes, if you will. And that's when you really start looking and saying, well, if these are all of the things that I want to do, you know, how can I start to make this a reality? Because we all know that someday is not a day of the week. And when you really look at your calendar and say, are these dreams reflected on my calendar? How will I ever make time to incorporate things like this into my life when I have so much that isn't fulfilling or meaningful? 
And so that would be my first tip to really get clear. Oh, I love that. I love that tip. Anna, you know what I hear? I hear a lot from the women that I work with when I say to them, um, what's your dream? What's your goal? What do you really want out of life? What legacy do you want to leave? What destiny do you want to fulfill? They literally say to me often, I have no idea. No one has ever asked me that before. Right. So I love that you suggest that. And everybody listening to this, you need to do this. I'm doing it. Yes. I'm already, (laughs) I'm already in my head going, okay, I want to go on a a cross Canada rail trip. Mm -hmm. I was planning on that one before COVID hit. I love Santa Barbara and I already know the house I want to go B and B Airbnb. I want to go stay in there again. Mm -hmm. Um, I love Italy. I want to go back there and you know, so yeah, so I can, you know, you can see I'm already like listing things in my head and I haven't even begun to write that list out and I don't have that list. So I'm going to write it too. Writing That's it awesome. Down. Thank you. Just, oh, of course. You're welcome. It just makes it feel so much more real. It does because it takes yes. it from being abstract ideas in your head into something that's more real that you can consider. And it's indulgent too, because it's just for you. And it's not about others' expectations mm-hmm. for you. It's just for you. And I'll say mm-hmm. that I, I've learned about this concept, the list of 100 dreams from Laura Vanderkam's book, 168 hours. 168 hours is the number of hours that we have in a week. And it is a fa- her book is a fantastic resource for time management and what's realistic. And that's a recommendation that she gives. So I really just want to make sure that I give Laura Vanderkam credit for that amazing um, exercise. Yeah. Thank you for that recommendation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And, you know, another goal that I set for myself for this year is this is my year to get healthy. Ah, yes. And one of the reasons I set that as I, well, I would put that on my dream 100 dream um, is last year I would, I would think, okay, every evening I'm going to exercise every evening. I'm going to exercise. And I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Every evening I would work later and later and later, and then I'd be too tired to exercise. So this year I am making it a priority and I am doing it at a different time than at the end of the evening Mm -hmm. so that I don't put it off. Well, Kathy, let me ask, do you have your exercise time blocked out on your calendar? Yeah, I've tried that and I kept moving it. So do you have a tip for, I kept moving it. Like, oh, I got to get this thing done. So I'm going to move that exercise time. Any tips for stop moving it? (laughs) Well, first of all, that is so common. It is very, very common. And so anytime you're looking to start a new habit or make time for something in your life that is, you know, it's for you, you know, working out, it's something that's important, but it's not necessarily urgent. You know, if we move it around it's not the end of the world. If we skip it, it's fine. If we skip it again, okay. And then it's a habit. And then it's a habit. That's how I got. Exactly. And so what I love to do whenever I talk with people about priorities is to have them think about big giant boulders. We're talking like boulders at the Grand Canyon that are ginormous. And no matter how hard you push on them, they don't move. Thinking about things like exercise, or for me, one of my boulders is bedtime, bath time routine with my two-year-old little girl, Camilla. That's a boulder for me. I will cancel, I will decline meeting requests. I will not schedule interviews. I will not do anything during that time. That is immovable, non-negotiable boulder time for me. And so once you've gotten clear on what matters most, and once you know what those habits are that you want to start, you've got to put your stake in the ground and call it a boulder, find a spot for it on your calendar first, first, like when you're planning your week, you have those boulders in place. And maybe that looks like worship time on Sundays, or that's, you know, a a call to your grandmother or your grandchildren, um, depending on, you know, where you are in life once a week. Those are those important, but not urgent things that we so often put on the back burner. Put your stake in the ground, call it a boulder, don't move it. The second type of priority I like to call are big rocks. 
big rocks are those things that, yes, they are important. They're also urgent, but you can move them around a whole lot easier than you can a boulder. Big rocks are those things in your life or your business that really move the needle. They're your projects. They're, you know, maybe that's a, a date night with your significant other. You don't necessarily have to do it at the same time every single week, but just making sure there's space for that so that, you know, you have that time set aside. And so it's thinking through, okay, if these are my boulders, if exercise is a boulder for me, what are my big rocks and how can I place them around the existing boulders in order for those items to fit? And if there's not enough room in your week, once you've got your boulders and your big rocks in, some of those big rocks have got to go. They've got to move. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I love it. That, that is great. And you know, once you were talking about that, because for two weeks now, I have done my exercise every day. Yes. And I've done, ex I, I subconsciously did what you said, which is I looked at my calendar and went, where can I fit it in on what day? Mm -hmm. So like yesterday, I had a gap in the middle of the day. And so I exercised then. Mm -hmm. um, it meant me getting on a Zoom session like this all sweaty, but pff, I didn't care. No. <laughs> I just told the guy, I'm like, hey, I just exercised. Sorry, I'm all sweaty. And he's like, oh, that's cool. I exercised this morning. Good for you. So, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I like that because it is hard for me to have a, an exact time unless I want to get up super early and do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that's where, Anna, sometimes I think, you know, a lot of people say, get up earlier in the morning and get this stuff done. And I think that is not going to make me happy. No, I'm not going to be happy doing that. So do I really want to make myself get up earlier in the morning to do this knowing I'm, I'm not going to like it? Well, so what do you think about stuff like that? Well, that's not the solution for everybody. You know, there, I, I have so many people that come to me and say, Anna, I want to get up earlier because I hear that so many successful intellectuals, yes. you know, important people wake up at 4.30 and they work out. Right. Like, well, why? Like, what is your compelling why for starting your day that early? And they'll be like, well, because other successful people do it. And I was like, no, that's not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. If you want to do anything, whether it's starting an exercise habit or getting up earlier, you have to have a very compelling why for getting that done or else you are not going to follow through. So that's your motivation. Your why is your fire to get started, your fuel to keep going. And you know, I would never call myself a morning person. I was up at 5 a.m. this morning making coffee and getting back in bed with my laptop because I know that that time, that's the only quiet time that I have before my day gets started. And I'm, I'm working a half day today because we have, you know, an appointment out of town. But I, you know, I have that compelling why of, if I don't get up at 5 a.m., then X, Y, and Z are not going to happen. And if X, Y, and Z don't happen, then that affects commitments that I've made to other people. And not following through with those commitments impacts my integrity that I have with those people, which is a compelling why for me. I want to stay in, in integrity with my commitments. And so you have to have a very compelling why. Um, there's a book called The Productivity Project by a guy named Chris Bailey. He spent about a year test driving all of these different time management, life hacks, productivity hacks to see what works. And he too tried to start a, you know, wake up at the crack of dawn habit because so many other successful people did that, but he hated it because he didn't need to wake up at 5 a.m. in order to have writing time or get work done. He had flexible time in the evenings when he was more mentally on anyway. So we quit and the world kept turning and everything is fine. So you have to do what works best for you. And we're all wired differently when it comes to when we're at our energy peaks and valleys and knowing that about yourself can help you cut yourself some slack if you're just not a morning person because not all of us are. Yeah. Well, I really love, because, you know, for 30 years, I had to get up with an alarm clock 
and get up at 4.30 to get dressed and ready and to my corporate job on time. Yeah. Okay? And that's what having my own business, being able to set my own time is where I go, you know what? I don't want to ever wake up with an alarm clock again if I don't have to. Yeah. So I don't. And I don't. naturally wake up at about 6.30 every morning. Yes. Which feels so good to not have that alarm clock going off. Yeah. Freedom. That's the, the absence yeah. of an alarm yeah. clock is what freedom sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Uh, so thank you for that because I too was like, how oh, these successful people get up at four 30 and I guess I should be doing that, but I hate it. Yeah. The other thing that I tried was having a morning routine that was meditation and journaling and stuff like that. And I think all of that is great. Yes. But what I like to do when I get up is I have three golden retrievers and I like to cuddle with them. And that's ah, what they want. Yes, They want petting and cuddling and to go in and out several times. And I want to, you know, drink some hot tea and have a, have breakfast. Yes. And so I'm like, you know what? That's what I want. I get to choose. So you that's do. what I'm doing and I'm enjoying it. Yes. I love that. I mean, and let's be honest, petting a dog is its own form of meditation anyway. Um, <laughs> so I have a, I have a Yorkie who's 13 years old, about five pounds. And I just love to reach over and give her a good cuddle, even though she absolutely, she is not a cuddler, but I'm just like, no, just let me, <laughs> let me smell your ears for a second. And that's oh, I know. A great, it's a great way so to good. start the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I have a 70 pound golden retriever who is a lap dog and oh, he good bed here and his whole body down mine when I sat in a recliner and we just sat there and snuggle and I have to have both oh. arms around him or he's not happy. Like right. if one arm goes to pet another dog, he's right. You know. I'm sure. Yeah. With the <laughs> nose and the paw. Yeah. 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 But I, I agree with you. I mean, that's just, it's love and mm -hmm. I want that in the morning. Exactly. So. You have to do what's right for you. Before my daughter Camilla was born, I had one of those morning routines that involved, just like you said, meditation, journaling, visualization, you know, the whole nine yards. And it was so great for that season of life. But yes, now it that that's not it's not even what I necessarily need, much less what I want. So yeah. it's it's being being okay with wanting what you want, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that just feels so freeing to me. Okay. So <laughs> now let's talk about the other challenge that I have, which I think a lot of people have, I know they do because they tell me about it, which is oh, yeah. you. So I like time blocking on my calendar. So I know exactly what I need to do when during the day. Mm -hmm. Time blocking. Do Love it. Like time blocking. Yes, absolutely. Time blocking okay. is one of the core you know, time management strategies. So I'm right there with you. Okay. okay. Cool. And it really is beneficial. I mean, I know exactly what I need to do when, and I will, you know, just like you, I never miss a deadline. I never miss a phone call. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say never. There I know is, I was about know, to say, I wish I could say I never miss a deadline, but, <laughs> but it's rare, right. Right. Um, that you're even five minutes late for anything. Um, that's how I've always been. That's how I like to be for other people. But when it comes to, okay, now it's time for me to do my work, wow. things that I don't particularly love to do. Like right now, I need to be reviewing a service agreement, for example, mm -hmm. and I have put it off for three days already. Mm -hmm. And just like I said, I move exercise. I move that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tips for how to, how to time manage that. Because when I move it, I'm wasting time Right. surfing from Facebook or something. It's not like I'm doing something more important. Right. I feel you. I feel you. So two, I've got two different, I guess, answers or two different paths here for you. Um, the first being, you know, we were talking about personality assessments earlier, knowing yourself, uh, Gretchen Rubin had the author of the happiness project has this amazing book called better than before all about habits, where she introduces the concept of the four tendencies. And these four tendencies are how you respond to internal and expectations, internal and external expectations. And so there are four different types. The rebel who does not 
follow through with internal or external. It's difficult to get a rebel to do Ooh. anything. An wow. obliger will follow through oh. for others, but yeah. not for themselves. <laughs> a upholder will follow through with internal and external. And then you've got a Ooh. questioner who will follow through with an internal, but not an external. Okay. And so knowing so I'm an obliger, I was going to say, I already don't like that term. <laughs> it sounds a lot like you might be an obliger. I'm obliger. an obliger. They are the most common type. According to the research that she's done, obligers are the most common type um, with questioners being second most common. And then rebels and upholders are the, the two smaller groups. Um, but the great thing is, is that once you know that you are an obliger, you can use that to your advantage. So accountability is huge for obligers. And so if you were to have an accountability partner, whether it's, you know, coworker or a friend, and you said, look, or a coach or a coach, <laughs> exactly. Or yep. a coach yep. and say, I, I need to review this service agreement by tomorrow. Will you please mm -hmm. check in with me tomorrow at 3 PM and ask me mm -hmm. if I've done this? Um, mm -hmm. That is one of the best strategies for an obliger to, to follow through with something that they don't want to do. And it begins okay. with, I can, I can oh, implement that immediately because yes. I can get my VA who manages my calendar and my email to ping me. Did you do yes. it yet? Did you yes. do it yet? <laughs> And because, you and know. by the way, Anna, there, I knew a VA and I don't know if she's still doing this or not. This was like five, five or six years ago. She yeah. called herself a professional nagger <laughs> and that's what she did for people. <laughs> that is hilarious. I think we all need our own like professional. Did you do it yet? Did you do it? Did you do this? I know. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, great tip. And it, that makes so much sense. And I just went, duh, why hadn't I thought of that? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Oh. I can do that accountability is huge. I, you know, I, I always get the numbers messed up, but I know that we're around 40 to 43% more likely to achieve our goals or follow through with what we set out to do if we write that goal down, right? So that's a pretty good percentage, you know, odds are, you know, mm -hmm. improved. But if you have an accountability partner that you check in with regularly, you are 95% mm -hmm. more likely to follow through with that goal. 95% mm -hmm. is almost 100. So if you don't have an accountability partner through, you know, a, an accountability buddy or a coach or a group, get you one mm -hmm. because that is how you make things happen. Yeah. And, you know, you just made me realize, so there's uh, other things that I would put off. And right now I'm working with a team mm -hmm. um, who's assigning they're my team, but yeah. they're assigning deadlines to me. Uh -huh. And if I don't meet those deadlines, then I throw the whole team off yeah. and I will meet those deadlines because right. I know that. So that's a form of accountability there too. So that's Absolutely. what I need to do. Thank you. Oh, Great you're tip. So, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. Yeah. Highly recommend that book better than before. And then she has an entire book dedicated to the four tendencies called the four tendencies. So well, we're going to have to put links to all these books in the show notes because the, I need to read all of them, obviously. They're, they're fantastic. Hey, one day I'll, I'll tackle one of those things on my list of hundred dreams and I'll have to throw my book in the mix as well, but we're not quite there yet. Do you have a book? Oh, that's, that's one of your things on your list. Okay. So I, I want to share with you that I, I actually had a dream since childhood that I wanted to publish a book that I yes. wanted to have a book. All right. But I never wanted to do it. I, I mean, I never wanted to do it. So fortunately, you know, I have the advantage of having all these virtual assistants and virtual experts that are amazing yes. that have gone through my training program. And one of them is a great writer. So she came to me a year ago and said, I hear you're talking about wanting to write a book, but I see you never doing it. Yeah. Would you like for me to tackle that for you? Oh, like, my goodness. Yes. Yes. So she put together, she put together a team. They did everything. I mean, everything. All I had to do was review like a three drafts. Super easy. It was published today. <gasps> <laughs> oh my 
my I'm goodness. I'm super excited. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. That is absolutely you. epic. Dreams realized. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You know? And yeah. how much does that say? I literally about? just before this, I literally just before this got off doing a Facebook live about it. So oh. it was, yeah. And uh, we'll do one, we're going to do one a year for at oh. least the next two years. And I, how much does that say about the power of delegation? You know, so many people are afraid <laughs> yes. of, of delegating or handing things off to other people for so many different reasons, but there really is so much power in having that trust and setting someone yes. up for success and, you know, empowering them. And then just, oh, that's wonderful. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. So I don't know if you want any help in delegating your book, but I know a great person <laughs> to okay. refer you to if you do. We'll have to talk. <laughs> Cause she, I mean, she is really, really good at project management too. And she kept me on track. She's one of those that's, um, the, the first draft of the book is coming to you on this date. I need oh. you to review it by this date. Can you guarantee that you can do that? And I'd look at my calendar. Cause I yeah. didn't want to, you know, sit, miss that de date. And I met every deadline she set for me. <laughs> that is wonderful. Well, let me get out of the newborn fog. Oh yeah. <laughs> in a couple months, because I would hate to see what kind of book I put together on two hours of sleep a day. Although that would probably yeah, no, be pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Anna, I, if you can't tell, I could talk to you all day long. I love your tips. Um, but we're coming to the time when we need to close here. So can you tell the listeners, because if they're anything like me, they're just salivating for more of you. Um, how can they get more of you? How can they find out more about you, work with you, any of that kind of stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the best way to continue learning from me is through my podcast. It's about time, a podcast sharing stories and strategies to inspire women seeking better work, life and balance. New episodes drop every single Monday morning. And so you can tune into that wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm also very active on Instagram. I love sharing the behind the scenes of what life really looks like alongside time management tips and, you know, sharing you know, how other women are doing things. So uh, I'd love for you to come you know, find me on Instagram and we can be friends there. And then I actually have something special that I have put together for your listeners that I would love to share. And I'm sure you'll link it in the show notes. So I won't even worry yes. about sharing the URL because, um, you know, we'll all forget it in five minutes anyway. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's so nice of you to do that. Thank you. <laughs> For the, for putting something together for the listeners. Yeah. Of, of course. So I find that routines, solid routines really are, you know, the cornerstones of our lives. They really help set the rhythm of, you know, how we approach work, life and balance. And so I put together a guide to designing routines that stick, which walk you, which will walk you through the process of designing what I consider the five essential routines, morning, evening, workday startup, workday shutdown, and a weekly planning session. Even having a, a slice of these routines in your life creates structure, creates just enough predictability and just a good rhythm to your days and your weeks. And so I'm excited to share that with all of you. That sounds fabulous. I love that. And I really appreciate you putting that together. So Anna, I, I think I'm going to have to have you come back on the podcast. I would love you. Days. You are such a delight. This was so much fun. <laughs> Um, congratulations on your new baby. Um, I'll be following you so I can get to see pictures. Yeah. And um, thank you so much for being here and helping me figure out some of my time management issues. I feel so empowered now. Ah, I'm, well, I'm so excited. That's all that I can ever want and hope for is that you feel empowered and, and exciting about something like time management and getting things done. So thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Until next time, bye everybody. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. 
Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm-hmm.